Thank you all for coming this evening. We've got a fairly long evening, so we better get started at 7.30. Before we do start, this evening, uh, this all-candidates meeting, the other all-candidates meetings that we have, fireworks at uh, Orford, it's all put on by uh, citizens of Orford and Heige. Um, we are part of Chatham-Kent, but we are also Orford and Heige. And we are looking for volunteers. It's not a big job. We probably only meet three or four times a year. But we do need some help to keep this going. So after the meeting, if you want to get a hold of Deb and Bowman or myself, uh, and give me your name, we'll uh, get you signed up. There's not much to sign it up. You just show up at the meetings. But. <laughs> anyway, um, this evening we've got uh, our mayoral candidates, council, we also have public school board and the Catholic school board here. Now, just for the simple reason that there's just so many people, I'll, uh, I'll mention the uh, people running for the, for the school boards. I'd like them to stand up, uh, be acknowledged, and after the meeting, if there's any questions, they can be directed to them then. For public school board, we have Randy Campbell and Scott McKinley. And for the Catholic School Board, we have Carol Bryden. Now, like I said, at the end of the meeting, if you have any questions for these people, uh, feel free to, to uh, hunt them down and, and ask them. Um, this evening, the, um, I just looked out here and I got the names of the candidates, so we're not gonna take the time to draw names. Uh, you're going to get up when I tell you to. <laughs> um, you'll have a three-minute presentation, and then uh, we'll go from there. So for mayor, we have Diane Gagne. I'm a person. There's a microphone in front of you, Diane. Gentlemen, and thank you for oh, thank you for being here this evening. All of us come from different walks of life, different experiences and challenges, but we all have one thing in common, and that is the love for our, fam for our families, our friends, and our communities, and we care about what happens to them and to us. My husband Dan and our 13-year-old son Brandon and myself live on the family farm, and not only understand the challenges of farming, but we live it. We finally just got our beans off. My stepmother has just returned home after spending over a year in the hospital and having her last rites read to her twice, and my father traveled to London every day to be by her side. Like many of us today, we are dealing with senior parents with health issues. My two brothers, but both of my brothers lost their jobs in Wallaceburg due to company bankruptcies. One has found employment and the other has not. We have family small businesses that struggle under the burden of a tax system that has small business paying more than its fair share in a global economy that's restructuring and affecting many of our residents. I share this with you because it explains that I understand the issues and the burdens that many of you deal with today, and through my short term as mayor, I've worked hard towards trying to address these problems. I lost my thing. Lost my time here. 
We have and we are strategically losing, using low-cost debt for major infrastructure challenges such as bridges, roads, water, wastewater treatment plants because you shouldn't have to pay for it all up front for something that lasts 75 and 100 years. We've created almost 3,500 new jobs and diversified the economy in pharmaceutical, logistics, distributions, communication, retail sectors, and over 50% of those jobs have been in manufacturing. Yes, the restructuring of the automotive industry and the manufacturing in particular Ford, GM, and Chrysler losing 50% of their market share has had a ripple effect of several bankruptcies in Wallaceburg. But we will overcome this too when we work together. We won our challenge with the provincial government where they wanted to take away $12 million, which would have been on your taxes, and we got $10 million back. We are beautifying the neighborhoods and the streetscapes through partnerships through the Community Improvement Plan, the Community Partnership Fund, and the Communities of Bloom, working with you. We've established over 120 projects throughout Chatham Kent using approximately $800,000 and uh, leveraging almost $3 million in projects in your communities. And that's something we should do more of. We've invested $25 million a year in what I call blue gold assets because water is the key issue in the next coming years to water in rural areas, new water, and tr water tre treatment plants. We've established our rates to the year 2025 for water and wastewater. And those rates in 2025 will be less than some of our neighbors are today. We could replace playground equipment at 43 parks. We could have just spread that out, but we felt every community should have it replaced at once when we were given those issues. We made assessing municipal services easier by putting online. We implemented high-speed access to over 98% of the community. We built Riverview, uh, Riverview Gardens, a state-of-the-art facility for our seniors, which they deserve and are honored, and we will ensure they get the proper care. We've developed brownfield and bluefield investment strategies. We've developed a Trans-Canada Trail system. We've also uh, developed a Tecumseh Park master plan and are working on a master plan for parks throughout the community. We've had success, am I done? Time's up. In physician recruitment with six dollars and seven specialists. Anyways, there's more to go. Thank you. Okay, the next one uh, I've got on my list here is Jeff Gordon. Thank you. Thanks very much. I certainly appreciate all of you being here with us, and thank you, group C W O H. Uh, that's a great group, and thank you for being so solid in your communities. As you know, I'm a small community also. I've always cherished that the small community endeavors and always worked with all small communities around me. Certainly, a couple of things that come to mind. I know there's some bylaws out here that we got to adjust and rebring back because it's terrible some of those bylaws that are pertaining to small and we should not. Those bylaws that are in the small communities have to be like on when you come up with it. We did one that was wrong in Ridgetown and that was the bylaw pertaining to the garbage that was taken away from them and that's not right. If they wanted to pay for that themselves, let them be there for themselves. We should not take that away. Attracting new business to the region, which should result in found revenues to the Chatham Kent and increased assessment growth and bringing new jobs. One of the things I want to look at seriously is the industrial park. I believe that those revenues should be attacked and brought down. I, th I really think that those lots should be sold at a better price to get more buildings on that site and that we can get the assets and the assessment growth, the building permits, and in turn would put jobs to all of us in Chat through Chatham Kent, especially in the areas such as where I'm from, which is in Wallsburg, that would also benefit. And today, everybody likes to have that job just in the backyard, but sometimes we might have to travel, but we have to get those. Those jobs are big time for us, and that's very important. I've uh, been married to Darlene, for 35 years, got a boy and a daughter and three great grand granddaughters. Not great. <laughs> I said that not quite that old yet. But I do appreciate being here and thank you very, very much. Uh, the next up is Richard Erickson. Well, 
Well, good evening. First thing I want to do is apologize for not being at the fair this year. I was terribly ill with pneumonia, and I could not make it. I wish I would have been able to see Johnny Cash and Elvis Presley that you had up here. But uh, that's neither here nor there. Everybody's talking about small towns. I'm from Fletcher. We got a whistle stop. We used to have a silo, but they tore it down. <laughs> but uh, I do enjoy coming to Highgate, Martin's Garage, and a few other things. I've seen a lot of stuff disappearing. The variety stores, the coffee shops, and the rest of it. But this has to be all redone. I mean, uh, the thing is, uh, there's way too much taxes going out and nothing coming back to the small communities. We even lost our street light. And I mean, it's dark out there in Fletcher, believe me. So uh, anyway, any questions anybody has before or after the meeting? My name is Richard Erickson. I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you very much. Some of the people at the back there, there's one, two, there's four or five chairs up here at the front if you'd like to sit down. Next one is Jim DeSat. Hello, I'd like to thank coming to My name is Jim DeSat. I'm 48 years old. I have three children and two grandchildren. We need change at the Civic Center, and real change requires new leadership. We have a mayor that can't get along with council. We have administration setting the policy. We have a ballooning debt and a ri rising taxes. We need a mayor that will work with the council, a mayor that's accessible to the public, a level playing field for all the communities in the municipality so that we can work towards the common good for all the people. Thank you. Uh, next on the list is Randy Hope. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming this evening. It's important that the democratic process continues in our community, and this is a demonstration of that. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Randy Hope. I'm 47 years old. I'm a widower, lost my wife in 2004 to cancer after only five weeks of, from the date of discovery to the date of her death. During the 1990, I ran in the provincial election, was re elected uh, representing the riding of Chatham-Kent at the young age of 31. I served in the Ministry of Community and Social Services for the complete five years where I had continuous dialogue both with federal and municipal governments over issue of cost sharing and the issues that we face today about money. I have uh, two children of my own, two stepchildren, and three grandchildren. Um, tells me either I did something wrong somewhere, but uh, they're a prize in my life, and they're very important. And as I get older, I want them to be a part of my community. So for the time before, after my wife's death, I was solicited to run for the chair of the mayor, which I agree, and today I stand before you as a candidate. One of the important things is for us to listen to what you have and the questions and concerns that you have. And most importantly, we as elected officials must start to govern versus own. We need to show that the people were true, that we are truly representing them. I gave up on the political system, the political parties, because you did not have the democratic right of actually representing those who elected you. Today I stand before you as an independent, a person who promises to represent every individual in this community with the honesty, the openness, and the most dedication that I can give in order to serve you, the most important, the constituent. So ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to tonight to the questions, and in my closing remarks, I'll show you the direction we need to go. Thank you very much. And finally for Mayor, Walt Spence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank Hope for putting this on tonight. You know, this isn't working very good. Maybe I ought to not do it. How's that one working? Hello, Dixon. There we go. And uh, also, I'd like to thank you all for coming out tonight. It's a good crowd. Standing room only, and that's what I like to see. And by looking over the crowd here tonight, it looks like there sure is a lot of farmers here tonight. 
and I know they got questions they want answered. So ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who don't, don't know me, I'm Walter Spence. I'm running for Mayor Chad of Kent, and we can't continue to increase taxes, less services, and a growing debt. It's time for change, and this can be done with you, the support of the taxpayers. I understand that by the paper that uh, Chatham Kent's running a deficit. This is unacceptable with the debt that we already have. I understand the school boards no longer can run a deficit, so why should the municipality? Our farmers are having a rough time of it right now. They uh, have got low prices, high taxes, high costs, and it's pretty hard to make a nickel today farming. And I think what we need to do is we need to approach our government because if you remember we had the land steward pro project, land steward program, and I think that needs to be brought back. I think this used to be offered by the upper levels of government. Now apparently the federal government has got a surplus of dollars. This would encourage the farmers to conserve the land while consuming less fuel and letting the microbes rebuild in the soil. And this would be a win-win situation for all the farmers. Dealing with the provincial and federal governments for funding and legislation is one of the mayor's duties. And to see that the taxpayers in Chatham can't get the maximum results. I know a lot of the sitting members, and this helps. And uh, it also helps to obtain the best results, especially if you're friends with the ministers. Chatham Kent is, or has, a lot of people that have asked would provide leadership in business. This knowledgeable people would become involved and stay in the community if they knew that the taxes will not continue to rise as they have since the year 2000. This also applies to the business of farming. The mayor's position is one of leadership, understanding, direction, and being supportive of council. I have the experience to provide this leadership and direction that is needed. And I would ask for your support on the 13th to make some of this happen. And you and I both know that it needs to be changed. Thank you. Now, for our council. First up, Steve Pensino. Good evening, folks. It's nice to see such a big crowd out here. My name is Steve Pensino. I am a 43-year-old business owner from Thamesville, and I am a lifelong resident of Thamesville also. I'm married uh, with three children, my wife Jane, my children Katie, Nick, and Julia. I stay very involved with my children through sports and other activities. I am a 15-year volunteer firefighter, the last seven as president of the association. I belong to the United Church Drama Group, where if anybody's been there to the plays, I act in uh, probably about half of the plays that they've had so far. I've spent most of my working life in management positions where in each case I've managed to work to the highest level. My platform is really quite simple. I want fiscal responsibility. Fair taxes, no unnecessary spending. I want to work on fine-tuning our streamlined services to make them more effective and um, efficient, cost-effective. Uh, I want to reunite East Kent back into Chatham Kent and remove the identity crisis which uh, we all feel. I will work towards equality across the whole community, meaning everybody's treated equally. I am a goal-oriented individual who is fair, open, and I will listen to the concerns of the constituents. Thank you. Uh, next we have Hans Vanderdoe. 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 How's that? There we go. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Hans Van Der Doe. Three words. Really simple. Anyhow, I'm a 37-year-old truck driver. I live in Tensville with my wife. 
and our three small children. They all go to uh, Good Shepherd uh, Catholic School there. And uh, why am I running for council? Well, I want to see progress, ladies and gentlemen. The last council, they kept giving us promises and kept telling us they were going to do things, but nothing actually got done. I'm here to work. I'm not here to make decisions. We need to get things done. What are we leaving our children? What are we telling our children? What are we leaving them? We're leaving them debt, the threats of closing libraries, cutting back emergency services. How can we do that? How can we tell them, well, sorry kids, there's not gonna be a Santa Claus parade this year. That's, that's not how it works. What we need to do is we need to work with the small communities as council members, either in East Kent, North Kent, whatever ward it is, as council members, we need to work as a team. I will work as a team, I will be a strong voice for East Kent, and I will make sure things get done. Thank you. Now we have Jim Brown. That's all the court I need. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody, and welcome. <laughs> Got her. <laughs> My name is Jim Brown. I was up here three years ago, so I'm going to bypass all the long introduction on who I am and where I was and what I do. It's been three years. You know what I do. I represent this ward at the council table. I'll find out whether you like that job or not on November the 13th. We haven't won them all, but we've been there getting your views across. And I believe me, we hear. And I've heard from you, many more than I probably could get into this room. I've heard from you when you've enjoyed the decisions we made, and believe me, I hear from you when maybe the decisions just weren't exactly right. And we remedy those, or we attempt to. You know where I stand. You know that I support you 100%. I look forward to some of the questions that are going to come here tonight. Thank you very much. Next is Jamie Meyer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jamie Meyer. I'm a 37-year-old married father of four, and I've lived in Thamesville for 27 years. My children are 11, 9, 6, and 4. I live at 65 Lemuel Street with my wife Jude in the village, uh, where both Jude and I also work. Jude works at a newly opened factory called JVD Manufacturing, and I have been self-employed since 1994 at Meyer's Technical Services as a mechanic specializing in fire emergency vehicles and equipment. I've been a fireman for Station 8 Thamesville since 2000 and also Vice President of Thamesville Community Credit Union as well as our Warsville and newly opened Dutton branches. I have been with the Credit Union since 1995 where I was an auditor for several years before moving up to the Board of Directors. Tonight I am asking for your support to allow me to represent you on the Chatham-Kent Council. I am very concerned about the future of this municipality for my family as well as all the people in Chatham-Kent. There is no way we can continue to go on the way things are now. We need to pull together and regroup as a community again in order to put an end to the monster that council and administration have created. This monster I'm referring to is a mega city that has not only drained every last cent out of our former communities prior to amalgamation, but have also managed to take our morale and identities as rural communities that once made us great. We need our rural identities back in order to make this work. It has been proven over and over again that rural and urban do not mix. They are totally different and they have totally separate wants and needs. Choose me and together we can build a better future. Thank you. Next we have Mark Everly. Thank you, Brad. I thought you were going to leave me to last. Anyway, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is, is a difficult place for me to be right now. I haven't very much to say because I think all of you know me. You know what I've done. 
you know what I haven't done, and I, I know you'll tell me what I haven't done, which I hope you will. I have tried to answer the questions that have been uh, asked of me. Sometimes you didn't like the answers, but I got the answer for you anyway. And uh, I do ask that you will support me again. I have enjoyed the three years, and I would look forward to another four years representing you in this ward. Thank you. And last, we have Mike Kent. Hello, everyone. For those of you who weren't at the elimination draw, for those of you who weren't at the Highgate Fair, I'm Mike Genge. I'm here tonight to uh, run for Ward 3. And the big part about this that I've got three points that I really like to hammer away on. The first point is, is about progress. Progress for Ward 3. Not progress for Chatham, not progress for the rest of the municipality, progress for the people that live here in Ward 3 which is what we're here for, this is where we live. The second thing is respect. We need respect on council. And what I mean by that is, we need councillors who can work with each other, who can work with the mayor. And we need somebody in there that's effective so that when you ask questions or you've got needs, there's somebody there who's going to get some answers and somebody there is going to work very hard for you and sometimes they're going to have to go around or maybe under or maybe over but they're going to try really hard to find other ways of doing things because it sounds like in ward three from what i've heard you've all not got the answers from the councillors and from the administration that you have right now and it's important to get somebody in there who can get those answers and get things moving for you in ward three the next thing is we need to get administration and council to live within our means. We all have a budget. We all have our, in our home. And I think the biggest part about all this is that we don't have an effective system of representation that is telling administration that we don't need just one answer on questions, especially when it comes to budget. Here's the budget. Here's what you've got. Now you're going to have to live with it. We need administration to listen to the council, and we need strong counselors to be out there telling the administration what to do. So on November 13th, when you go out and vote, look at my name and remember that I'll be somebody that will help you and that will look at different ways of being able to get things done effectively. My name is Mike again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, we'll have questions from the audience, but you've got rules to follow, too. The questions can't be any longer than a minute in time, and just one question, not a run-on question, or two or three questions. So think hard. We need one question. The candidates will be, um, um, have two minutes to answer each question. Uh, the questions can be directed to a specific candidate or if you, if you want uh, more than one, you'll take more than one candidate. But we're trying to keep this as short as we can. So uh, I've got one question that was given to me beforehand. Uh, this question is for Diane Gagne. Yes or no answer, please. If elected, will you be serving as mayor for the full four-year term? I will answer it the way I want to answer it, because I'm not going to play John Ryan's game. He's been destructive to the community and with the rock group for a long time. I'm not playing. I am running for mayor. I am committed to be mayor to this community. I have always and will continue to look after your best interests. I will not count down to somebody's game. Okay, now, questions from the floor. If you really want, you can probably, I think Deb's got some paper back there. You could write one down and you send it up to the front if you really wanted to. Earl. Fred, I, uh, I actually had two, but I'll make one. And, uh, 
think I can do it in a minute here. If I can, if I can just, if I can just read it. Okay. Okay. And this uh, this could be a bit uh, controversial, not only for the concerts, but for some of the uh, members of the uh, of the audience tonight. But uh, please bear with me. Considering the in increasing opposition to industrial wind farm projects, including here in Ontario, would you as council and the uh, candidates for mayor be willing to put a moratorium on further wind projects until we've had the opportunity to fully examine the reasons for this <coughs> opposition? And uh, I just did a little bit of research, and this is just a little bit of the concerns from south of the border and here in Ontario that have cropped up fairly recently. And uh, a lot of them have to do with health concerns, uh, everything from uh, stray voltage to, uh, to a lot of other uh, kind of unnerving uh, issues. Okay. You got your minute, Earl. Uh, did you want that to all the members up here or uh, anyone, specifically? Anyone care to respond? Yes, he's wind farmed. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Naturally, it's got to be fully investigated if there are issues. Um, and any concerns would have to be looked at first before you could go farther with it. That's just common sense. Thanks. I was going to say, Opai Fletcher, this is where they're putting a lot of these wind farms. They're putting a lot of wind farms around. Uh, Essex and uh, Wheatley area, and yes, I've been studying a lot too up around Godreach and where the cattle aren't milking. Uh, farmers are quite annoyed. They said they sound like a small airplane in the middle of the night and this kind of stuff. Yeah, they have to be under study. And I think it's the public's idea and the public's uh, ingenuity that should be telling the story if we do want them or not. I think it should be up to us, not up to anybody else. Not the federal government comes on and slashes all our trees down and then turns around and says, okay, we're going to stick a bunch of uh, wind towers up now. <coughs> I don't think we need to do that. I think we should see them actually working on see what kind of difficulties there are causing in these other places. Jim? Thank you. Earl? Yes, I, I don't have a problem with that. We council is just working, and they worked with one through the last uh, a zoning on one within the last month. Personally, I had a little bit of problem with it because the zoning was moving ahead of the EA study. I would have rather seen that, e and so there is an EA study coming on that one down there. It is amazing, it, great. Uh, we need to look at all sources of, of energy, and wind is one of them. However, since then, yes, I have received a ton of information on wind farms both pro and con, good and bad, and I think it needs to be thoroughly looked at before we load this whole area up with them. So yes, I think we need to do a little more investigation on all sides of it before we move any more. My, uh, my family has a, or my wife's family have a farm down in Rondo Bay. And you know, Walt was saying earlier, there's a lot of farmers in the audience here. And I look at this as an opportunity for some of the farmers that can't grow cash crops or growing cash crops and not making any money. I agree with the fact that having a bit of a study or having some study on it, that's, that's, you know, it's a good thing to be knowledgeable about what the effects are, maybe what the long-term effects are. But the fact is, is that farmers need this income. And it's something that is, is easy for them to do. The parcel, they go on one 50 acre parcel. And I think the trick is, is that if it's done properly and environmentally it works and it's within the boundaries of let's say homes, then I personally don't see a problem with it as long as it's been studied properly. But the fact is, this is one opportunity for off book income or off farm income that people need in this area. And it's something that they're just going to be able to sit back, come in, write you a check, 
and as long as there isn't environmental concerns, then I don't see a problem with it. But I do agree with you on the fact that if there is more research needed to be done, then we should do it. But I think in Chatham Camp, we have to look at new opportunities, and we have to look at ways of helping our local farmers. Thank you. Okay, Randy. Just a question of alternative energy sources. I mean, it's important that we explore those opportunities, but at the same time, be cautious about what we're doing. We don't want to hurry up and put a bunch of fields with, uh, you know, with the big windmills blowing all over the place, as you might as well say. The other part, the other part that you mentioned about a stray voltage, and I thought people were starting to forget about that because I remember Mr. Montgomery out in Dover Township and the other farmers that were in Chatham Township and every time they milked their cows, a stray voltage was coming and they wonder why the cows weren't getting any. Finally, we got somebody that's introduced a piece of legislation in the Ontario legislature which is hopefully going to address that. But you're absolutely right. I mean, we have aging hydro lines around here. We wonder why we have cancer rate the way we do. Those are issues we need to start paying attention to, the old energy source process, but we, when we do a new energy source process, we must make sure that we're making sure that our community is safe from any contaminations that might cause hazards to the health of individuals, and also to the environment as well. Thank you, Brad. They're at our place and near our place right now, looking for um, a place to put windmills. When we looked at it, we're, we're, there is a full year that they have to do the environmental assessment to find out whether they can put one there to begin with. A lot of the, the um, stories that we've been getting about the problems, the noise, it, it, there isn't any. If you go near one, I was in Pickering the day they started the big one at, at uh, the Ontario Power Generation. There is no noise. When you sit at our place, you can hear 401, and that is about six times as much noise as there will ever be from a windmill. A lot of these stories are told second, third, and fourth hand, and you know how stories are when they're passed from person to person. So some of these stories we have to take with a grain of salt, but we still have to look at them, and we have to make sure that these are environmentally safe. And they've been using them in Europe for years, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them and they haven't had many problems with them. So I think we've got to look at that as well. Thank you. I think you can hear me. First of all, the way the process works is it's the government that puts out an RNP and the provincial government, and they make the decision as to where they want to locate these wind projects. As Mark mentioned, um, I mean, it's very easy for us to stand up and say yes, if that's the answer you want to hear. But that's a disservice to all of you, and we're not doing the leader's role that you should be doing that. The reality is that it is a $270 million project that has been earmarked for the Port Alma area. It does create income for the farmers. It does create jobs. We have brought uh, the college, Ridgetown College and St. Clair College in. We've talked to the province of developing a center of excellence for alternative energy here, which creates good jobs and they use a facility that's going to be around for the site. All of those are positive things. An environmental assessment is done because we do not want anyone to be hurt by it. But all of the studies so far are showing that this won't be an issue. And if there's something that comes up and you can't mitigate the risks, then it won't go up. But if we're looking for jobs, manufacturing is changing significantly. And a lot of that is because of what's happening offshore. So if we've got opportunities to have a center of excellence for alternative energy, we're looking at ag agricultural byproducts as well, solar energy, all of those things, then we have to be open to those opportunities. We have to manage them property, properly and make sure that we don't put anybody at risk. But we're talking a possible center of excellence for Chatham Camp, which means good paying jobs and good opportunities for all of you. For us to just say, sure, that's what you want to hear with the easy thing right now, that would be the wrong thing to say. Well, uh, one thing, one thing that you, 
One thing you mentioned was stray voltage. I know that we have had a lot of problems with stray voltage in Chatham Kent. And as the name was mentioned, Lee Montgomery. He fought for years and years to get that stopped. The new systems that they tell me can corral that. Now, I'd like that shown to me that it'll work. Now, I've got no problem with wind energy or any kind of energy because it will create jobs and, and bring, bring money to Chatham County. That's fine. But they're not going to bring something in that's going to create this problem because we can't put up with that. Because we do have hog farmers, dairy farmers, and that. And the dairy farmers in the area, we have made the isolation for them. It takes a lot of money on their part to do this isolation. And the same thing can happen with this Kruger company or whoever's coming in, because I know they're in the whole area now. They're out in our area too. But the thing about it is, is that you're right. This has to be a guarantee before these things are the switches on, because you're looking 47,500 volts to 110,000 volts coming off these pieces of equipment. And the thing about it is, they must be properly installed and looked at. But no, the one thing that you're talking about straight voltage, that's one thing that's down my alley, and I make sure that that didn't happen. Do we have anybody else? Next question. I'd particularly like to hear from uh, Jim Desat, Richard and Randy, and then anybody else who'd like to respond to this. What are you willing to do to support the Medical Recruitment Division of Child and Tent? Uh, Jim? You asked what are we? Oh. Can we go first? Okay. You asked what are we going to do for the medical recruitment? First of all, let me explain. Medical recruitment division. Division. Let me first of all explain. My wife and I were a victim of our doctor retiring, and we were out without a physician, which I believe was part of our case. What I believe needs to be happening in the recruitment aspect of it is approaching the provincial government on a stronger tone of voice. And also on a stronger tone of voice, put alternative ways that doctors can locate here. The doctors are overworked in this community, and they've emphasized that on a number of occasions. Between their practices and their offices and, and having to do their duties at the hospital. We need to ensure that there's not just one coming because we'll lose that one just as quickly as we gain them. What we need to do is pre present a proposal to the provincial government on how we can get more here. And at the same time while we're doing that, we need to make sure that they're in, for, in the information loop, making sure they have the ability to R&D. They want to be a part of the global network of medical professions. And I've heard that from 1990, and doctor's issues have been going on for a long time in this community, and especially in Tilbury, where I grew up at. But the thing is that we need to be a stronger voice in that community and be leaders in making sure that the health and well-being of our people are first and foremost. Richard? Well, to answer your question about the doctor shortage, I talked to uh, my neighbor, Mr. Hoy, not too long ago about this. And uh, we spoke several hours about this, and they are spending a lot, a lot of money, of our money, into recruiting doctors all the way across Canada. I said, what would the problem be of paying the doctors some of this money to stay here instead of when they do get here, jack their taxes up so they can't afford to stay here and they have to move? And this, uh, I don't know, they've had a lot of problems through Chatham, all the way Windsor, all over the place of keeping doctors. Lincoln Hospital closed their emerge the other day because they never had a doctor to fill in and they had to fly one in. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. I think the government people should be held responsible for this of bringing in doctors and they're spending they've got I don't know how many millions of dollars they have spent already into this program of bringing in doctors I think we should be uh, making them when they do go to school sign a contract that they will stay in Canada a certain amount of years if we're paying for their schooling I think they should be staying here Hello? Oh, it's working. 
Yeah, so I'd like to first say that the doc recruitment started in Wallaceburg from a group of concerned citizens there and spread out from there. Um, what we need to do, I believe, is get more provincial government monies involved. We're coming up, all this money right now is just contributions and donations from the, from the public. What I think we should do is pressure the provincial government for more monies and at the same time they're going to have to open more spots in the schools for doctors because we do have a shortage of seats in the university to even get uh, people in there to start uh, getting educated to become a doctor. Thank you. That's a good question, Andrew. I sit on the committee and I go out and make the calls and I do the ass to get money for this. And I think the big part about it is, is that what we need to understand in Chatham Ken is we've been very successful bringing in doctors compared to other areas. And I think the big part about it is I've been working on the Health Alliance Board for the last eight years, PGH and then with the Health Alliance. And I still sit on the PGH board, foundation board. And I was one of the people that suggested we should combine all our efforts together to bring, bring doctors to this area and to put together a pool. And when the Rosemary Miller Fund came, came out after Rosemary had passed away in Wallsburg, what it came down to was is that now we had an opportunity at that time in Wallsburg. Now we have an opportunity for any of your kids, any of your grandkids to get an education that's paid for by us. And that's the best part about this. I got a 13 year old and a 15 year old and I'm looking at them and I'm saying, if you want to get into medicine and do what your sister, what your aunt Martha is doing, then the opportunity and the money is there for you to do it. We have a new child psychiatrist coming, which is unheard of in this area. That's a big plus for us to have in this area. We've had some losses, but we've also had a lot of gains. And I think we all need to get on board with this. And I think that's the biggest part. If we want to have doctors in our communities, we need to have good facilities, but we also need to pull together as individuals and work on it. And as a council person, this would be a huge priority because it has been a huge priority in my life to do this. So I think as a community, we need to get out there and look after this situation. And I've been doing that for years. Thank you. Thank you. I just love to talk about this one because I was the co-founder in Wallsburg when we started this. One of our mottos in Wallsburg was to train our kids to be our doctors. We got the young green boy from out of Dresden will be our first one out coming out. I think it's next year when he'll be coming out of that program. And I'm really, really pleased. I made the commitment to Rotary almost six years ago now that we would do seven doctors at the cost of $50,000 each to $350,000 over the next seven years. And we made that commitment with Rotary and we've been doing quite well. We've now expanded that Rosemary Miller Fund, as Mike has said, across Chatham Kent now and we're going after 2.7 million. We just went over the million dollars this, this last couple weeks ago and I'm vice chair of that group in the community of Wallsburg and North Kent and that's huge for all of us. And the commitment is certainly they got a contract for the four to, to five years that we can only hold them to be in our community if they would decide to leave after that. But that's been uh, a big one that uh, I've been in working with for a lot of years and it's really close to our heart because as we all get old and I don't see if any of us here getting any younger and we certainly need to, we all need doctors. When you get people calling you that they're they're, uh, they don't have a doctor and they're crying. You can appreciate why we went there. Thank you. Uh, Walt, if you want to speak. I'm not sure whether your question was answered or not, but the thing about it is, is that we have a slight problem in Chatham Kent with the doctors, at least what they tell me. They say that uh, what happens is that administration wants to tell the doctors and nurses how to do their job. I know that when I sat on the board uh, of the General Hospital years ago, our job was to make sure they had the right equipment, the right place to do the job, 
And that was it. The doctors and nurses made the decisions about health care, not the administration. And I think we're running into that now. And that is part of the problem. And that has to stop. If we want doctors and nurses to stay here, we have to give them the right to make these decisions. They are the doctors and nurses. They're not the administration. They're the doctors and nurses, and they deserve to make the decisions about you and I and our health. Um, I think it's important that that comment can't just go by. The administration, Chapter Health Alliance, and all the community groups that exist, it's not just Wallace, but remember the communities have these recruitment trainings, have worked very hard in their partnerships for success. So I, I can't let that one go by. I think more to the point of your question, there's two things. Besides the fact that our, our family has contributed significant dollars because health care and education are the two most critical things to the success of this community, to the people in this room, to the rest of the citizens in Chatham County, to Ontario. And we have to wrap our heads around that. As a council, quite frankly, we need to invest more in that. And I think that was the point of your question. We can lobby, we're doing that. I work with Mr. Switzer, the local integrated health network systems. We know they're holding up, setting up community clinics. We got doctors ready to come in, and they're not freeing up the money to put the buildings in. He's going to work with us to put the pressure on Smitherman. But besides all of that, the sad part is that as communities, we have to compete for these doctors. So as a council, we need to ante up these dollars in because it's one of the most critical aspects for each of you in your lives, but for the long-term sustainability for any quality of life that we're going to have in this community, in our ability to attract jobs, any of that. So as a council, we need to put money into it. That has to be a priority in the budget, and I think that was your question. <coughs> Thanks, Brad. Good news. I don't know how many of you saw the news before you came here tonight. Since I'm so close, I saw the news before I came in. This is good news for Windsor, and I'm hoping it'll flow down into ours. There are 11 doctors returning from the states to come to Windsor. And I'm hoping that that's going to continue and they'll move farther this way as they come. So there are some good things. Good point, Mark. The problem is nobody wants to live in Chatham's camp. That's the problem. Taxes are too high, we've got no jobs, and most importantly, the first thing we tell our kids, well not mine yet because we're still young, but what I was told is get a good education, get out of here, head east, get good money, good jobs, you got all the amenities, anything you want. So that being said, if we don't put a uh, proposal together so that when the doctors do come here, that they do have all the toys that they like because they live a little different than we do, some of them. They like the parks, they like the rec facilities, they like the, the uh, anything to do with rec. So if we don't put something together like that for these people, they, they don't want to come here. And if they can live up there for the same taxes that they pay for a house down here, thanks to MPAC, why not just stay up there? They have everything. So that's what I think as a council we have to work on mainly is get the taxes under control and get stuff here that these people like and enjoy and they're going to want to be here. Until that happens, they're not going to want to be here. Next question. Our former Highway 2 recently reconstructed uh, now is in worse shape than it ever has been since it was a gravel path. And I would like to know, presently, what's going to happen as soon as it starts to get snowy and blowy? Because we're not going to be able to plow it. It's in rough, rough shape. And it's no longer the season when we pave roads. So, to anyone who would like to answer my question? <laughs> actually, yesterday afternoon, because I drive down the road, it, it's actually dangerous. It's, uh, it's an awful place to drive, and especially if it's raining. And it's under that accident. Okay. I have 
Yeah, I was going to say, like, should I? The papers will be there Monday. That's not a promise, however. That's what I have been told. I, I, I did call because we have we have problems out here on number three. I hope those potholes got fixed today. <laughs> no, they're, they're on their way. They're, they're finishing. Make sure that the payment that they put on there will last. They're, they're, they're doing some action testing and they're making sure that it is done right. I was told yesterday that the papers, everything is looking good, that they will be there Monday. No, the holes were filled. They're not painted. Okay. Oh, by the way, the road over here. Hopefully, they fix the holes because they're not taking the paint. Three until they're done. Oh, yes. But they're, as soon as they're done there, they're going to the other side. Richard, you were both ready to leave here. Did you say Highway 2? Yes. Former Highway 2. Oh, it's Road. It's road. Oh. <laughs> I was in Asphalt Paving Company for a while for Cayuga. Uh, Van Gassen worked for him for a few days as an inspector on some of these jobs. Paving, you're right, has to be done in the summertime. A lot of the roads, and I mean, I've been down back roads I never knew existed, especially up through here. I mean, there's gravel roads that aren't even on the map in Chatham County. You Kirk up through there, I'm talking back roads. We live on gravel. And uh, the services, yes, have windows in the last, uh, I would say, a few years. But I mean, to uh, say when these big companies are going to come in, is probably just about the same time they're going to jack our taxes up a little bit higher to pay for the paving that has to be done through Highway 2 and Highway 3 and the Merlin Town Line and the Dalton Side Road and Mallard Line and a few other thousand roads through Kent County. And I do hope they do Highway 2 quite shortly. I hate driving down myself. And the 401. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jim was part of the uh, the, the road has been inspected. The engineers have looked at it. It was a compaction issue. And we're going back after the contract that was put in to make sure that that road was 100% what we paid for. And we're talking big dollars. And tax dollars have paid for it already. Tax dollars will not pay for it a second time. And hopefully they can fix it. If they're saying that quick to me, that means a temporary fix, uh, not the real fix. And we aren't going to settle for less than the real fix. So you know, I, I, I hope that it, it isn't a matter to the spring, but that's a possibility if it turns around. The tests that they've done, I'm not a techie on this, but apparently you're allowed like this two points or whatever, and it's six or seven points on what. So there is uh, an engineering problem with the road, and we're going after them. So, I mean, you hire these things. We're supposed to be ex experts in it. Whether it's weather or whatever that contributes to it, I don't know. So I don't want to badmouth the company, but it is not the job that we pay for. So we're not going to settle for that. So it, it's being addressed. But no, I'm not going to say there's a good fix for it. But you aren't going to pay for it twice. All right, excuse me, are you going to redo Gosnell line too? I don't think that's such a great job that was done for the money we'd be paying for. You know what, if the if the roads aren't right, okay, I mean, I, I travel a lot of roads here myself, I. all over the place. So I see some of them, I don't see all of them. So if the roads aren't right and there's a problem, the most important thing for you to do, a whole bunch of you, not just one, so they just don't think somebody's a little you know, particular about the road. Send in your complaints, please. Because we that's tried that, time. but we just keep getting put on a recording all the time. But then, you know, in, in all fairness, call my office. Tried that too. Sorry, but it's the truth. In all fairness, Rosalie is there 99% of the time, but she does have to take lunch every now and then. Okay. I have not heard from anybody. I didn't know lunch was at 4.30 in the afternoon. Sometimes that's when she gets it. Huh. Can you imagine if you had to wait for your roof to get done? Roof to show up on a Monday, get your roof off, show up three months later and put the roof on. I thought you think you'd be kind of ticked. I don't know why these uh, papers are just like tearing it up, waving it. Maybe they think we all have four-wheel driving. I can run around. But, uh, 
No, I, I have no idea why it's taken that road so long, because if you notice these papers on the 401, they come up, they grind it up, they inspect it, guys behind them laying it down. Too easy. Why can't we get these contractors to do the same thing? There it goes, a work issue. It's called getting things done. And even as a council, they could have said, well, hey, if you're going to go up there and do Highway 2, then we want to see it all done at one time. We don't want to see you jump from Highway 2, fix a couple of potholes on Highway 3, go over to Gosnell, fix that crack over there, and then get back at it. No, we want to see one job get done, then move on to the other one. Vote for me, that's what I'm for. <laughs> I'm not necessarily sold on the idea of uh, the way they recycle the asphalt now. I know we're in a world of recycling, but it seems to me that's second class. Any roads I've seen, and I've seen them here, here on through to London, when they grind them up, the as the car, they put it back down, it's never the same. The old system of grinding off the top inch, putting on new asphalt, seems to be better, and I don't know it. It just seems like when we did it that way, we didn't have issues. And I think that really needs to be like that. I'm going to go out on a limb here. Yeah, and if I was a betting man, it's probably one of the cheapest contractors we could find in the area to do the work. It's probably done twice as fast as what it should have been done. And there probably wasn't even a time limit put on it. So, that being said, this goes back right, right to administration, <coughs> indecisiveness. Um, that's what's got to stop. When you want something done, you want it done right. Sometimes the cheapest isn't always the best. Most times. We've been proving that over and over. So when you vote people in, make sure that you get the right ones in there. They're going to make those decisions and make it once. You get sick and tired of paying for things over and over and over again. And I'll guarantee you. We're going to pay again no. for something out there, one way or the other. There'll be some little hidden thing in there, or engineer's cost, or uh, uh, an oops. But we're going to pay again, because we always do. That's not going to stop. Where was the city engineer that should have been signing off on that before the paper ever moved his vehicles and his equipment off of that one? Uh, probably getting a consultant to find out what he probably, has to do. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Thank you. One of the things that we have the same thing over on 78 going to Dresden. Rex, you've been on that one. And you know, I, I argued with them and I said, why do you go in there? The problem is, uh, first of all, I want to start with, is that the, the off and on parts of it, you have to hit it like you're, you know, it's just terrible. And they don't, all they have to do is clean that up and put on the off and on a lot easier. But I've told them, and I, they never answered me, I said, why do you open that road up and take the coat off before you know when you're going to put it back on? I said, you guys are crazy. And I haven't got an answer out of that, but they're coming. They're coming, they're coming. Appreciate it. Anybody else want to number one? I just have one comment. I hope it's a local contractor that we hired that lives within Chatham Kent. If it's not, he can walk away from it and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay, we have any more questions? Chatham Kent has not grown in the last 40 years. We've heard a lot of comment, both from the audience and among the candidates, that people believe the taxes are too high. Over the longer period, even if one does everything that you suggested and more creative ideas, there's only so much efficiency that you can get out of the existing cost system. The other side of it is if you want to reduce the tax costs, increase the tax base. I'd like to ask the candidates what plans would you advance, what approaches would you take towards increasing the number of taxpayers or other parts of our tax base? <coughs> It's a good question, Tom. I think what it comes down to is, and, and this is what I've seen, from the standpoint of economic development, the one thing I've found that's really been lacking is that economic development isn't out talking to the people who have businesses here now who can network with other businesses that they're working with. 
I have clients that I know for a fact have never had anybody from economic development come to their facilities, and these are growing companies. They don't know about subsidies, they don't know about infrastructure, they don't know about any of these things that are going on. But the best part is, these people are growing businesses. And they're working with other people, other companies, that are growing as well. And what we need to do is, we need to get people from economic development to work with you, to open up some doors, to say, how do we draw those, those suppliers, those customers, into our area? I tried last year bringing Unigasco Community Credit Union to Ridgetown. And what it came down to was, the community wasn't interested. We had meetings, we sent out flyers, we did all those things and it didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen was the community didn't want to bring it in. We need to open our minds up and say, hey, let's look at some opportunities to create some jobs. And we need to look at economic development and get the people that work there out working with you to talk to you and say, hey, how are you being successful? And how can we bring these people out? And that's something that I do, and that's something I do in my business. So that's one thing, Tom, is increasing that tax base by bringing companies here. And I mean here in Ward 3. That's the biggest part for me as a councillor in this area. How do we attract people here? We make it so they want to come here. Um, I'm going to go back. We could apply the same thing. It hasn't been that long. Richtown. We don't have a lot of huge buildings and huge activities, but going back through the years and the people that we attracted there, and actually if you stop in tomorrow, I can play it to you. We have some of them on video. They drove in. The town was clean. Our roads were paved. <laughs> the town was clean. They, they looked through. We had affordable rates. We had affordable taxes. It's, they were impressed when they come in. The first time they drove through the municipality and they didn't see litter and they didn't see weeds and they didn't see the junk laying on the side of the road. Keep it neat. That's the first impression that we get from people if they happen to get a flat tire or for some reason we get them off of 401. We have to impress them as soon as they drive into the community. We used to do that because they come in and these tree-lined streets and there's no litter on the road. And then they stop and you know, they get a hello. They look into it. They see neat homes, they see neat properties, and then when they look a little farther, they see affordable taxes. To be quite honest, I, in my business, and, and with some of them, they're coming to Richtown, they're looking at some of our empty stores, and this is very recently, the guy picks them up, he goes, well, I've, I'm looking to open another business. I have a business in London. The taxes on that building are more expensive here than they are in London. That is a problem. You know, like, we do the comparisons, but we got to keep our, our, when companies are looking here, it's PUC rates, it's the taxes. We have to make it attractive here, so sometimes we need to go back and look at the basics. Take a hard look at our community when we drive in. Sometimes it's not spending the million dollars up here to get them here, it's spending a few dollars down here to make that good first impression. I think Jim's right. If you keep your towns clean and it's nice and people drive in. I can't agree with bringing economic development into your area. The last two times I brought them into the area, businesses wanted to locate there. And this is not hearsay because I was involved in it. And for some reason or other, they want businesses to locate in the bigger areas. But we have everything in Ridgetown. We have everything that they want. But for some reason or other, they weren't located there. And I do know that we in Ridgetown are lucky. We've got more business per capita than any place else in Chatham-Kent. And I like to brag about that, and Jim can back that up. But the thing about it is, we need to bring more business into Chatham-Kent, not just into Ridgetown, or not just into Blenheim, or not Chatham. I don't care where the business comes in, they still pay taxes, and the taxes go to Chatham-Kent. So if we can entice them to any place in Chatham-Kent, I'll support that. Because this is what we need to do, and there can be more jobs created, because there are some new types of businesses out there that are willing to come, but we've got to entice them here. Thank you. There's a couple of little things, and I appreciate that, Tom. A couple of little things I'd like to see done. And nobody's bought in with my idea, but 
maybe somebody can hear can see through my thinking. One of the things I'd love to see is all we have out there right now is Chatham Kent. Chatham Kent. What I would love to see, and we would drive this to get people to come here. Can you imagine them saying Chatham Kent, home of 23 communities? And that's what we got to drive home. They'd be interested. When you see the home of 23 communities, can you imagine that person seeing, wow, there's got to be something happening here. There's, they're big, but there's going to be something happening in those 23 communities. And that's what we have to drive home. We at Wambo, we see people coming into Wambo. When somebody comes in with a big, huge boat, they're coming from somewhere, and they've got some big dollars behind them. What we try to do is do surveys see who they are, what they're doing, and try to answer back if they want to. And we talk to these people through email. We, get, we take their emails down. And that's very important, and we try to go after them. And sometimes another thing we try to do is I try to encourage when somebody bring an activity here in town or bring something in, into our community at that August event, we try to get them here. Uh, we bring some other uh, I know what one thing we brought some trucks here from out of state that was that was important and that encourages them to see the harvester and their new pickup that we brought. So what we try to interchange with that and we're trying to do our part with that. Thank you. There's only one way to help with taxes and that's business. And we need business offset our taxes. If we don't have companies here, we have to take the brunt of everything. We can't make business come here. We can't beat them over the head. We can't drag them in here. But what about all the businesses that we have here now that are up and running? What are we doing to help them? We're taxing them and taxing them. You tax them, then you charge them for this here little, uh, they need a license for this, they need a license for that, they need another permit for this, they need a permit for that, permit, permit. That's all they do to us, constantly. So, right now, we can take care of it from the point of view of helping our little businesses out right off the bat. We can do that. we got control to do that tomorrow. We can start it. But we can't bring big companies in. Once we help our little companies, and they can grow and employ some more people, get the ball rolling. It'll be a slow process, but it will work. And then we can start drawing the big guys in. We once were an excellent um, place around here. John Kent was, well, it wasn't John Kent then, but uh, Wallsburg, Tilbury, all them, like everybody wanted to be here. They wanted to apprentice here. The apprentices turned into journeymen. Journeymen wanted to stay here. We have to do that again. That's what our kids want to do. Our kids want to connect mechanics, electricians, plumbers. It doesn't matter what it is. That's the key. And then we can keep them here. Then we'll draw in the big business. We've always been uh, in Chatham Kent, industry first. And that is a good thing, obviously, because that's jobs and everything else. Um, maybe we need to shift gears a little bit and start working more community thinking. And obviously, the doctor. Um, problem is an issue too because nobody wants to come to a community if they can't get a doctor. Like, why would you? Our population has dropped a little bit and obviously that hurts on our bottom line for taxes. So we do need to, A, we need to, the small business, work on them, whether that means lobbying money from our federal and provincial counterparts to help them out, as well as our, our big industries too because they will put forth money and we've seen it with Navistar before. It's done under a different type of uh, a grant, but they do come to help when you need it. And Chatham Kent does need it because our, our population is going down, our businesses are leaving, and Wallaceburg is a perfect example of that. So we do need help, I think, from our provincial and federal counterparts. Mark. Thanks, Brad. I think we need a little different tax as well to add to all these things they're doing. We don't work with tourism sufficiently. If we had people <coughs> passing through here as tourists, and the attractions here, they're going to come, they're going to look at it, and when they look at it, they're going to look at everything else around. Then they move on to the next place, and they will talk <coughs> about it. We need to work on that aspect of it so that we show what we've got. We've got 
occurs in things here that nobody's even thought of yet. I can name you about 50 just standing here. And we do not promote those. I think we need to promote it. Whether it's a bus coming in and a step-on guy, I did that for a few years, and we took them on the tour. It's amazing the number of people, if they come in and the, a month ago, who have never seen a tomato harvesting machine. It's amazing the number of people that never saw a spoke barn. There's a whole rack of things that we have not touched yet. One of the things we must do is start the leadership realm. With the mayor and the council working effectively together, a strong mayor who prides about the community and emphasizes the importance of this community in the, in the lifestyle that we live. A council that works effectively with the mayor in making sure that we put programs and we implement things in a timely fashion instead of waiting years and years. Negativity is one of the biggest things that hurts us. And just because a community group has a viewpoint, we must work together and bring things. So when people research the community, whether they want to live here or whether they want to invest here, they have looked at the local newspapers, they have asked questions, and people are standing united, not divided. Yes, we are 23 different communities. So you need an effective council that brings people together, which amplifies the glory in this community, then you will get investors, then you'll get the young people, we'll get our own young people to come back to this community after they educated themselves and want to start a business or want to move in some direction which is going to stimulate our economy. But first of all, it's got to come from the leadership. The mayor and the council have to be an effective council in order for us to do anything in this community. We can talk about all the nice programs that we got. We can put all the nice billboards about see our water, see our communities. But if we have not got an effective council and a mayor that talks about an effective way of bringing people back into the community from education programs and then bringing new investments in, people have to love who we are and want to be a part of that. We want people to be banging on our door saying, I want to be a part of that community. Because why? We have strong leadership, strong council, and a, a vision of where we've got to go. Jim, do you want to address that? Yeah. I agree with some of the things said here, but also I'm wondering if somebody from economic development should not be going to these places where companies have started something, for instance, Woodstock, Somebody from economic development go to Woodstock and ask the mayor, what did you do to attract this business here that we can do? Or go to Toyota and say, why did you pick this area? Did you consider us? Did you not consider us? Why did you? Why did you not? And also, our head of economic development, when he goes out to do a presentation to a potential investor, and then when he's done, and the potential investor says, and where do you live in the community? He says, I don't. I live in Ingersoll. Then how does, that make the, how does that make the investor think of the community when your head of economic development doesn't even live here? Thank you. Uh, it's interesting to listen to what they say about the taxes and that, and, and quite frankly, we've been independently identified as one of the lowest cost places for people to do business. So if it's just about cost, they be here, and it's not just about cost. And we have to look at it from, not through our eyes, but the people who are making the decisions on where to locate. This is taxes, people are paying three and four more times here, the residential owners. But all these people who are saying that, I, I have yet to see a council vote against raising your house taxes in order to reduce the business tax. That's not going to happen. So we are dealing with that environment. They can tell you all of that, but let's talk about the real world. The key thing, we've had a company that we were dealing with, and you'll see them on London. You'll go past uh, Wellington Road, the right-hand side, Rosa. I sat across the table from them. Their own calculations, they would save a million and a half dollars in operation costs in being here. But they said, the issue was, we went around, and we promote every community, quite frankly, not one or the other. Please do your homework and research some of the misleading statements said tonight. They basically said, we went around to all your communities. Your facilities are old. Yes, you have lakes, but you haven't developed it. Where are the trails? We bring our spouses. We bring our kids, the people that we attract to be here in the community. What are you doing for the growth of post-secondary education? As everybody's retiring, and we have to attract people here, they center the Toyotas all that I meet. I, I'm with Mayor Wolcott all the time. It's about centering around colleges and universities. 
they cluster around that because that's where research is done, that's where the workforce is going to come from. We can talk about all those other things, which is why we're looking to partnership with the college, both St. Clair and Bridgetown to help it grow. Doctors are key, healthcare is key, which is why we have to invest in it. Arts and culture, green space, recreation, those are all things they're looking for. We love where we live. We think it's wonderful, but it's not meeting the level of what these individuals are saying, looking for. Someone down here said the same thing earlier. We have to wrap our heads around that. We can talk about everything else, but we've got to build that community. <laughs> Why not we bring all this stuff in other yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, My question is for the mayor, and I listened to what you said, and it sounds okay. Earlier you talked about uh, globalization and the big three downsizing and all that. But to me, I work around every other uh, uh, center, and they seem to be growing and attracting the industry. And someone in the chat and paper said about a year ago that we're a island of despair and a sea of prosperity, and that's the way I see it. And, for us as citizens, we look to the council for leadership and for action and for results. You put an industrial park in and all there is is a trucking company in it. And uh, I, I just think it should be held accountable for the, the, the failures that have taken place. And maybe it's the administration. I don't get it here. I don't know what the problem is. But we're not getting the results and we're not satisfied. The, the job is just not good enough. So my question is, why should we vote for you when the results have been so poor? Well, I, I differ with you. Having created almost 3,500 jobs and 50% of them in manufacturing, we've got pharmaceutical, which we didn't have before, logistics distribution, and increase in retail. You know, if you want to talk about what the issues are, I've explained some of them. So you can bury your head in the sand and ignore that, because that's been a big part of it. They are going, we've lost 20,000 union jobs in the area, and 50,000 non-union jobs have gone down the road around the colleges and the universities. Now, you can ignore that, you might not like it, I don't like it, but that's part of the reality of the situation. The other thing that I think is important is the Economic Development Department needs to be taken out of the municipal hands and be an independent corporation, as it is in London, as it is in Oakville, as it is in Windsor, all of those places. Because politics creates where we can't even allow people to go visit the people they have to visit. Mr. Kaim out of London visits Germany and Austria five times a year. That's where the relationships come from. They don't go looking around saying, hey, come on to chat and Ken. You've got to build those relationships. But we have issues in our community that everybody wants to ignore. And if we ignore them, guess what? They aren't coming here either. So we have to address those issues. We have to be progressive. We've got to build our colleges. That's why we've got residents going. That's why we're looking at facilities. It's not about a marine argument, folks. It's about building the college. Kids look at programming, and they look at college lifestyle. And let's be honest, what do we have? That's why they're not growing. If we don't make those investments as partners and not increasing your taxes to do it on top of it, I believe all your arenas, all your parks, we should be investing in money in that. We should be doing less in some of the areas. Those are the things that people touch and feel and want. And that's what we should be focusing on. So you can blame me, you can blame council, you can blame whoever, but it's all of us. If we don't wrap our heads around what those individuals are looking for, you can keep pretending that Keep it the way it is. If we don't address those issues, if we don't address post-secondary education, if we don't address doctors, if we don't address culture, it isn't going to happen. I just want to quickly dovetail on what Stan said, uh, and I'll, I'll direct this to the mayor and to the two city councilors, and if anybody else wants to jump, jump in after, that's fine. With all that you've said, and Ford, Chrysler, and GM downsizing, and what you've just explained as to why we can't get companies or larger corporations to come into our community, would you not suggest that maybe we put the cart before the horse when we built our big uh, industrial park without investing the money in the infrastructure to support it? Okay, first of all, um, I get beat up on amalgamation. Amalgamation happened five years before I was here. There's nothing to do okay. with amalgamation. But I'm, my point is, I'm not the one who started the industrial park either, okay? So I inherit some of the things, whether it's right or wrong. In the long run, should you have that? Yes. Was it ever built to take on a large industrial plant? No. It was only 120 acres to start with. It is to meet the development so we can diversify our economy. We are looking at brownfield strategies in all the communities to do it. Do we have under option approximately four or 500 acres? And are we talking to a potential investor? Yes. 
and it's not in the industrial park because that type of land doesn't exist there. Toyota, four or five hundred acres. So, you know what, you can blame me. I inherit those things. I have to deal with them, but I didn't create them. So all I can do is understand the realities of the environment today. We are working with the province and the feds, but folks, unless we really come to terms with what the issues are, and start making investments in those areas, there's nothing the province can do for you. There's nothing the feds can do for you. Someone said it down here, you cannot force companies to come somewhere. They come because they want to. And as I said earlier, if it was about cost, low cost, they'd be here. It's not just about cost. And we need to come to terms with that. So as far as long term is the right thing, sure. Wealth is putting up a 400 acre industrial park. Others are buying up land. London is expanding theirs. You need access to the 400, you need access to the 401, you need access to the 402, to the 403. So does it mean just the, <coughs> the one that's uh, the industrial park of 401? No. There's opportunities in Walmart Street. There's opportunities everywhere. You're close enough in Bridgetown. But so you can throw bullets. I'm not used to taking them. I inherit it. You take the job, you take it on the sins of the past. But it's your interest we're looking after as well. So we've got to grab our heads around this and make the right investments and the right choices. Otherwise, it will continue to be the way it is. Thank you. A good question. I guess that was there before I arrived at the table as well. Uh, we inherited. We all inherited this. Now we have it. Now what are we going to do with it? Is it price? If I, if I hit me wrong, however, I believe the lots are right on the four hundred seventy thousand dollars an acre. Correct? Yeah. Get on the internet. If I'm looking for a place to invest. And quite honestly, I'm not selling anybody else, but I find you industrial land on 401, and you go up and down 401, and you can find $10,000 an acre. So we're going to have to do something to attract some people here. As far as the industrial part, no. I don't know what we're going to do with it. Hopefully, I mentioned this the other night, hopefully they won't, when they plow it up, plant corn, they won't dig up the water lines, because someday we may use them. The problem, before we went out, yes, it looks nice in the south there, I don't think that those, those great big 5,000 employee plants are available right now. And if somebody wanted to open one, there's a lot of big empty buildings you could probably pick up for a dollar. But we had, and still have, acres of industrial land in Richdale, in Chaz, in Bothwell, here in Highgate. There's property here. We're 30 seconds off of 401 here. Bring us out there. We'd sure love to have your company. And as far as that, that big that I would just as soon have 10 small little millwright plants of some sort that employ 10 people each. That's as good as one company. And at least when one of them goes down, they don't lay everybody off. But we should have marketed better and filled up all of our acreage that we got in all the 23 municipalities before we went out to move them. What else is there to say? <laughs> it's right. But I still think we need to get those small companies. Instead of trying to get the big companies, let's start with the small ones. If we get the small ones, the big ones will follow. And I don't think we're looking at those small ones. I deal with a lot of the corporations that you talk about on a daily basis. Their concerns are not with what's out in the environment or whether we have recreational facilities. They're concerned about hydro costs, an adequate hydro that's provided to the plants. They're concerned about the taxation level. They wanted to address that. They're concerned about the labor cost and its proximity to the marketplace. These are the things that the corporations look for. They also look for a skilled labor force. And you're right, I agree. We ought to take Richtown College and St. Clair College, but we ought to break away and have our own identity. Because every time we get a good program at St. Clair College in Chatham, it ends up in Windsor. Look at the nursing program. Very successful here in Chatham. Where is it at now? Windsor. We need to control our own destination on skills development and our labor force that we have. But we have the marketable tools for industry to set up here. We don't need a lot of major industries as far as new arenas or a lot of trails. Yes, we need some luxury, luxuries in the recreational department. But we've got to address what the corporations are looking for because they're dealing in a global competitive marketplace which has labor, which has hydro, which has taxations, all those factors. But one important thing we have here in Chatham, Kent, is a skilled labor force, and 
we are not marketing that skilled labor force at its maximum capacity. I agree with what you're saying. We need small business, but I understand though now from what we've been told is that Highgate and Bridgetown and Bothell and Thamesville aren't slated for growth because we don't have the stuff to make people grow. We don't have enough hydro or enough sewage or enough water. Putting that aside, there are companies out there that are small homegrown industries. There's a lot of those around. You have in Highgate, Ridgetown, Bothell, Thamesville, all kinds of buildings that are setting empty. We need to promote those. But what we need to promote is the skilled trades because we don't have enough skilled trades. I'd love to have some more skilled trades. I trained nine of them and I got one left. I sure wish I had two more. But everything ties together. And we're just a small area and I agree we need small businesses. And that will turn into something that'll grow. Jamie? Seeing this uh, industrial park in Chatham, I'm, I'm just about dumbfounded if they want to get another 420 uh, acres or something. I can't even imagine the cost of that would be. Um, that being said, these uh, companies that want to want to come here, um, what are we, we're, I don't understand. We're, we're not doing anything for them. I'm having a hard time trying to figure out, like, if it wasn't about, about the money, like, I can't imagine a corporation sitting there and saying that we can't move the child again because we don't have parks. And the bottom line is that they were, they're actually going to save a million plus dollars to be here. Like, I just don't understand that. Because money's money, I don't care who you are, what you're doing, it's always the bottom line. So I don't really accept that. Um, also, with... Uh, Thamesville, we have, have a little back there, Chatham Fabrics, and some of you might know, some might not, it's just on the news. We just got a company uh, called Centroy, Mr. Athroy, moved in into this building here to make it even bigger to start out JVD manufacturing. Now, as a counselor, I've already been in there and want to find out what's going on and what we can do to help and if we can make it bigger or what, what's going to go on. So that to me is very important that you have to be there with these people and you have to interact with them, find out what's going on. And we can have we can have factories. We always did in the little towns. They don't all have to be in Chatham. They don't all have to be on the 401. Like they can be anywhere within Chatham County. Uh, thank you. If you remember going back to my opening remarks exactly what I said earlier. We have to look at that property. I have no way, no way to give it away. But I'm going to tell you, we have certainly come up with at least a good market value that we can live with. Because you remember, they're going to buy building permits, assessment growth, the taxes go up, and they're put people to work. And there's no reason why economic development can come up with a package that I'm only using this just just come on my top a two for one special, right? Anything, Trace, <laughs> do something. That's what I'm trying to say. The blue light special. Trace like, uh, at their hospital. Though. Yeah. That's what I, it's uh, it, yeah, but you can laugh at it, but you gotta do something. Be creative. Like I like we said in Mallsburg, you get one operation at the hospital, get the second one free. <laughs> I, 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 you gotta, you gotta say something. You gotta do something, and that's where we gotta. Be. Thank you. You know, it's funnier. Earlier, someone asked a question about economic development, and I stood up and said, "We need to work with each other." Now it seems like everybody thinks small business is the way to go. <laughs> Diane said we need to take economic development and take it off of the politics. I agree with that, but we also need economic development to be told what to do. And we need them to make sure that they live in this community. I agree earlier with, I think, Jamie that, or one of the other members that, it's really hard, and I work in sales, to try to sell somebody to move a company here well, you don't even live here. 
I, I, as, a, as a prospective business owner, I would ask that question, why don't you live here? But I think the big part of all this is that I'm telling you, the trick is we need to work with people and maybe some of those people do want to buy a property out at Bloomfield. Maybe they do want to expand their company. Maybe they do want to hire more people. But nobody's asking them. So let's drop the prices. Chip's blue plate special. <laughs> And, you know, let's look at what the baseline is. And maybe somebody here wants to build a bigger factory and they can't afford to because the price is too high. But they say, you know what? I will build out there if the price is down here and I will employ more people and I'll bring people from Bothwell. But in this area, I think what it comes down to, can I speak please? I think what it comes down to is, is that we need to, to sit back and we need to look at each other, we need to help each other, and we need economic development to help us small businesses. Thank you. Richard. I don't know. I, I've heard... I, I heard a lot up here right now. Of, I can't believe 75% of these people do not know why Kyle would never come to Chatham Kevin. It's called CAW. When Joe McCabe and a few boys went up there to the union, they said, bye, right quick. They don't want no unions. Why did these factories leave Wallsburg? They moved up north to get away from the unions. This is what we have to start doing. A lot of the plants at one time needed unions. International Harvest was great. I worked at Navistar for a short while. But the unions have to be stopped one way or another. They cannot step on these companies coming into Chatham Kemp right off the bat. Give them five years at least. Then go and approach them. But they go right in, and make money all the way across the board. So now they're paying these people that could have been here in Chattanooga thirty dollars an hour in Kitchener instead of being in Chattanooga. Anybody else? <coughs> One more question. I, was, I don't want to say. I just want to say. Um, I was in business on the main street of town for 33, 36 years, from 1956 to 1989. And when I first started, there were 10 gas stations in Bridgetown. There's two left. Two. That's all. Two. And it's going downhill. All we're doing more taxes and paying more money to get less. And a while ago, they wanted to close the high school in Bridgetown. Well, I don't know. It all makes sense to me. One more question. I know. I know what we're seeing. Way back here in the corner. The first question that was asked was of the mayor, and it was by somebody that obviously she knows. My question is posed to the rest of the mayoral candidates. What is your position of your length of time that you wish to spend as being mayor? Diane doesn't want to ask, so I'll leave her out of it, but I do want to ask the rest of them. Thank you. Okay, Randy. <coughs> Twelve years. <laughs> That's like anybody going to a job, it's called commitment. Thank you. As long as my brother stayed in politics, I'd like to stay. He was in power for 22 years. And I think he'd done quite a good job running Chatham. And he was very sick when he started with Chatham County. And uh, there's been a lot of things done between now and now. I, I think, first of all, I'm going to answer that because I did not say that. What I said was, I want to be mayor, I am committed to be mayor, and I am committed to do the best, always have and always will for the citizens of Chatham Kent. What I said was, I will not play Mr. Kreiderman's game to say, answer yes or no. I am not, he's been playing games in the paper and stuff all the way along. Well, if you guys want to, if you guys want to follow that garbage, then I so didn't you. follow that, Diane. It was just a question. I had no idea where it was come from. And whether you choose to believe me or not, I was ignorant to the question. I didn't know. Well, then I guess did not know where it was coming from, but there was a question that was asked, and there was a question that was very answered to me. It was answered very negatively. So you didn't see the ad that he nope. pulled out the Chatham Daily nope. News nope. the same no. thing? I don't, I don't get the Chatham paper. No, you no. don't. And whether you choose to believe me on that, it's fine. I'll send you a copy, and that's why I answered the way that I answered. Thank you very much. I'm going to go right on to the point. 
I have done years and years of service, and not just in Wallaceburg. I've done my lifetime commitment. I want to be a server, not a ruler. And I want to be there as long as you people want me there. Real simple. I came here to take the views tonight just because I don't want to be the mayor. Your question was, will I serve as mayor as long as I can get elected by the people? Definitely. I served 26 years before. I think I can serve another 20. That's life. I could get two lives out of it. <laughs> Uh, so I'll, I'll also guarantee that if I'm elected mayor, I will be there for the four years. And if you so elect me again, I will be there as long as you elect me. And mayor still hasn't given you an answer. Yes, I have. No, I She's don't. not said if she will stay there for four years, guaranteed. Thanks very much, and uh, thank you for coming out tonight, and it's been great in Ward 3 that every meeting we've gone to, we've had a great turnout, and it's good for me because it allows me to be able to meet you and get my points across and do it in a format that's very structured and has gone very well. I'm going to go back to my three points again, and that's what I'm going to keep hammering on. Progress. Progress for Ward 3, that's what we need here. We need people to have jobs and we need to create jobs here. We need to work with businesses here and try to help you develop your businesses and bring people that you're working with into your communities. The next thing is, as a counselor, we need respect. We need people who are gonna work together with council so they're not butting their heads against the wall all the time and coming back to you and saying, nobody's listening to me. I'm tired of nobody listening to me. You know, I'm tired of that statement. Nobody listens to us. We're all fighting. Well, you know what? Let's get some strong people in there that don't yell at each other, but see each other's point of view and stop the fighting so we can move ahead in Ward 3. And the last thing is we need to get, we need to get administration to start understanding we gotta live within our means. And that's the most important part is everybody is feeling you know, there's this big triangle of taxes that goes from residential to farming to commercial. And all they've been doing is pushing it around. If the farmers are hurting, they push it on the commercial. If commercial's hurting, they push it on the residential. It's like a game. But what we need to do is, we need strong counselors in, in, in council to tell administration that you need to do the job differently. Don't come back to me with one report. Come back to me with some ideas. When you're getting paid that kind of money, stop thinking inside the box and start thinking outside the box. And that's what we need for Ward 3. Thank you. Oh, on November 13th, vote Mike Genge. <laughs> Smart Alec. <laughs> Hans and I have been fighting all ever since we started this. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what a wonderful crowd as usual. I'm so proud of you and so proud of this, this particular area of Chatham-Kent. We have worked together and I want to continue to do that. We've accomplished quite a few things and uh, for those of you who don't know, we did get some money last uh, this week and we're going to do a reconstruction on the corner over here to make this much more attractive when you drive into Highgate. I hope that you will consider what I have done, consider what I can do, what I will do, and I promise you that I will do the things that you ask me to do as far as absolutely possible and I respectfully ask for your support on November 13th. Thank you.
Thanks, Mark. Now more than ever, we have to pull together and stand up for ourselves. I'm tired of indecisive bureaucrats hiding behind overpaid consultants running our municipality. The Sunshine Club has to go. <clears throat> Jeez, just about choked on that one. <laughs> they don't want to make any decisions anyways. I highly suggest that if the people do not want to live here in our community and help support our local economy, they, then they should definitely not be working here either. We need councillors that are willing to work side by side with the very people that voted them in. Councillors that will stand up for what they believe in and not let administration run them. Some people seem to forget that councillors are the bosses, not the mayor, not administration. There seems to be a lack of communication across this municipality and that needs to be rectified immediately. Rather than me stand up here telling you, the people, what I intend to do for you, I need you to tell me what you want and then I can fight for it for you. That to me is how council should run. We all know taxes are too high and our identities have been taken away. That is not the question here. The question is, who has the balls to fight the monster and take it down so we can start to live again? <clears throat> There are so many issues that need to be addressed here tonight that it is almost impossible to touch on all of them. What you people need to hear is who is willing to fight for you and your families to get the job done no matter what the issue may be about. I am that person who will give you my all and I will fight for you to the bitter end. I'm Jamie Meyer and I'm demanding a better future. Thank you for your time and good luck to all. He left it on, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there are times that, yes, damn it, they don't listen to me. <laughs> or they don't listen to five or six of us. Well, they listen. We just don't always get through to them. We take, I do, I take your message there. Believe me, if anybody's been out to a number of the All Candidates nights, and we've been at some where there's never the number there is in Ward 3. Bothwell, Richdown, Highgate, you take your politics locally very serious, can tell. Above all, you take your communities very serious and that's why you're out here tonight and that's why individually, one at a time, and believe me, I think I've heard from every one of you, and I take that message over to council and to the table and it's there. When you leave here tonight, and what you should have been doing, you're not only, we're two votes over there from this huge ward, from Lambton to the lake, two votes at the table. What I need to work with as well is naturally your vote. If you've got, if you got by mistake another ballot card and can vote in another one, no, don't do that. That's <laughs> you can only vote once. You have family, you have friends, you have people that you work with, travel there. Talk to the people in the other wards. Find out what's going on over there. Find, go to their candidate meetings. Find out what's going over there so that we have people and then say, yes, that guy over there in the next ward, vote, you know, I can't vote here. Grandma, get up, get out and vote for him because we need people. Like it's been mentioned, it's a team. I don't know, sometimes that team does bother me a little bit because I always, in the back of my mind, there's concessions back there. Sometimes, you know, a hockey team is different than a team of council. Take the message over there, but we need, major we need people from across the municipality working towards the same goals. I didn't even notice he was standing there. They didn't look. There, is this one working? Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great All Candidates night. Um, there's a lot of people out here, a lot of great concerns. Um, four more years. Four. Four years. The people you're going to be voting in for are going to be there for four years. Do we want four years of decisions? Or do we want four years of getting things done? Do we need new doctors? Do we need more doctors? Yes. Do we need better downtowns? Yes. 
Do we need more things for our children, more industry for them to, to actually stay here and work at? Yes, but talk is cheap. We need to work at this. And as counselors, or as being on council, we have to work as a team with the mayor and with administration to get it done. But we also have to show administration that council is in charge and it will be the councilor's decision that gets it done. Not administration. Administration can only do so much. But if we elect an elected council, and elect a mayor that will do things and get things done, it'll leave a brighter future for our kids. Right now, the car's stuck in neutral and we're going nowhere. Let's slop it and drive and get things done. Thank you. I believe this ward needs a uh, positive change to remove the negativity and distrust and possibly counselors who will get along with each other. Along with new counsel comes new ideas and enthusiasm. We need to make this a healthy, affordable place where people want to come and live, raise their families, and just an all-around good place where there are jobs. The rural areas uh, seem to be neglected in the whole big picture, and I want to work towards making that a better place. If elected, you can be sure that I'll speak loudly on your behalf, and I will always be fair, and I will always be accountable. Accountability sometimes seems to be a difficult thing. This is a big commitment, as Hans said, four years, three or four times, and um, I, will, I will dedicate the time it takes to do this job properly. I will listen to everyone, and I will do my very best. I am Steve Pensano, and on November 13th, I ask for your support on the ballot for responsible counsel. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see the crowd out. It's good to see the questions that are asked and got some of your answers, I hope. But ladies and gentlemen, I, I think we need to thank the co-group again. I know I did once, but uh, they did a good job. And uh, the facilities here tonight are excellent. My platform is open government. And myself as mayor and the councillors will always be available to the taxpayer. I also want to keep our smaller communities intact with their own pools, their own arenas, libraries, and their own volunteer firemen. I also want to produce a workable budget and be accountable for the tax dollars that are spent. They're your dollars. You're just letting us disperse them. Finally, fair and affordable taxes. You've heard from all the candidates here tonight, and now you can make your own decisions on who to vote for. What needs to happen is you, the voters, must go out and vote to make the largest turnout in Chatham-Kent's history, because this vote could have a historical effect on the future of Chatham-Kent. To accomplish this, I would ask for your support on Monday, November the 13th, 2006. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity tonight. It was a pleasure to be a part of the democratic process. Ladies and gentlemen, when people tell you we have to live within our means, let's get it straight. We have to live within your means, not our means. So that's important when we talk about fiscally re being fiscally responsible. Ladies and gentlemen, there's some objectives we need to accomplish. Number one, we need to achieve operation, operational effectiveness and efficiency of our municipal operations and structures with accountability to the people. We need to improve our relationship with provincial and federal governments to maximize support for our communities. We need leadership, a strong voice, and a strong community builder that represents both urban and rural areas. And we need a strong leader that will work with its council in order to be effective. 
We must work on the issue of jobs, increasing the support to the current and future businesses of all levels, work and with established and new investments to create new and better paying working opportunities for everyone. Our most valuable asset in this community of chatham Kent is you. And chatham Kent deserves the change that I can bring in order that we may grow in a fashion that's affordable, social, recreational, and financially sound. Come November 13th, I ask for your consideration to lead this municipality and to have the honor of representing you as the mayor of the municipality of chatham Kent. So please, with your support, deep consideration on November 13th. Thank you very much. Well, I'd like to thank you for all coming out. There's a real good crowd here tonight. As, you can, as you've heard tonight, there are some problems up there. And what we need is some new leadership to take care of those problems. We have people that are paid by the municipality that don't live in the municipality. Tonight I've heard that things said about we could have and we should have, but we didn't. And we have to do it. I've heard that we inherited this, we inherited that. Well, how many years are you going to blame being inherited before you take the responsibility? We need a mayor and a council that can work together for the betterment of all the people across the whole municipality. And if you elect me as mayor, I will do just that for you. Thank you. Thank you all tonight. You know something? I could have sat back and stayed as councillor in Wallaceburg and probably could have won. I'm not sure. Never, ever know that. But I'm here for a challenge. And I've always lived for challenges throughout my whole life. I just want to, I'm not doing this to boast, but I got nine years Chatham King Council, six years Health Alliance Tribe Board, nine years on the Health Board, three years as Chair, six years as Vice Chair, six years as the Sydenham Hospital Board, nine years as Sydenham Foundation Board, five years Conservation Authority, co-founder of Rosemary Miller Tuition Fund, uh, Vice Chair of the Community Bloom, six years on the Fire Committee, inducted in Wallsburg Sports Hall of Fame, 10 years as Chair of Lambo, 30 years in coaching hockey, and on and on. The reason why I brought that up is I'm dedicated and I will always live and dedicate my time for you. One of the very important motive, talking about being well connected, I am. And I'll tell you the reason why. Last night I got a phone call when I got home, and this is important for you. I got a phone call that I'm going to have that, if we don't get it through Chatham-Kent, I'll have that uh, Thamesville Parade sponsored, and I'll do that. And, I'll, and they, I can't make all the promise, but I was talking to him this morning, and he'll probably back that, uh, that Thamesville Parade, and that's how connected I am, and I'm looking for your award. Thank you all very much. <laughs>
We need to make those strategic investments in our communities or we aren't going to be going forward. It doesn't matter who wants to cloud the issue, that's the reality of the situation. We do need uh, economic development to be independent with an independent board of <coughs> citizens, leaders, business leaders in the community who will hold them accountable, make it measures so that they can be done. We have to grow our post-secondary education through partnerships and we have to ensure that doing business here is competitive. We have to involve our youth and engage because you know what? We will not make it as a retirement community only. So we have to do those things every year. here. There's a lot of things that have been said here tonight, a lot of misquotes, a lot of mistruths about the debt. I purposely brought a sheet on that. Please take that before you leave to fully understand. I'm not going to spend more things about it myself. I think it's important that you all get the right information to make an informed decision. That's all I would ask of you tonight is to make sure that you do that. As far as my commitment, I'm committed to you as long as you're committed to me. Do I want to be here 12, 20 years from now? No, nor do I think I should be. We need to start getting you and everybody else that's going to be positioning this further as we go down in the new millennium. That's important for you and all of us. Because unless we bring those people in, unless we make that investment, our taxes do go up because the base isn't there. So I'm looking for your support. I want you to please look at the information so that you're making an informed decision and not misled by some of the issues that people are taking place right. today. Thank you. Thank you for coming.